For the next session, I wanted to give um, an update on the integration and lessons learned from Cilium with TCX and NetKit. And then the second part uh, um, to revive the topic on the global socket iterator. Um, so first, uh, on TCX, TCX was merged in the 6.6 kernel. Just a quick recap for those who don't know what it is. It's basically a um, more efficient uh, TC PPF data path, a modernized one. And what we get with this, aside from performance, is basically BPF link support, uh, and to have like a unified attach interface for, for links um, so that we can have multiple programs on the TC ingress and egress hooks. Um, Cilium eBPF library support got added by Lawrence in the meantime so that we can use it uh, from, from Go uh, for Cilium integration. Uh, so there's that. Um, I quickly go also over NetKit, so that uh, has been merged also since like throughout the last year. The, the main reason why we wanted to have this uh, weave device replacement was because of performance. So one of the goals was for Cilium to have the same performance as uh, applications inside the host namespace in terms of throughput and latency, what you can see here in those graphs. Um, and that driver, yeah, maybe for, for those who don't have the context, so basically how we get the performance, so we attach a BPF program instead of the TC hook on the, on the host, on the, on the ingress side for, for logical egressing traffic. Um, we attach a BPF program inside the device of the network namespace or pod in, in case of Kubernetes, um, then we run our logic there. And if we do the FIP lookup and we decide that, we sh that the package should be the sent out of the node, this can be done directly instead of going through a per CPU backlog queue, as in the case of Weave. Um, so yeah, that has been merged in the 6.7 kernel. Um, and it's also exciting to see that Ubuntu enabled this in the latest uh, 24 .04 LTS release, given most production users want to run LTS releases. So that's a nice win. We can use it uh, earlier in Cilium. Uh, IP Route 2 support was merged in 6.8, so unfortunately one version later than the actual NetKit uh, driver for the kernel side, but yeah, so, so be it. Um, in case of IP Route 2, basically it's just for creating devices and for introspecting the configuration, um, but not for attaching BPF programs. So that's basically the third to libbpf or the, the Go version, the eBPF Go. Um, then uh, from ByteDance, they made a contribution to the Go Netlink library in the meantime. They added support for NetKit because their goal was as well to use it in production. Um, so yeah, that was a missing piece for them and also for us for, for the Cilium integration. Um, and Datadog, actually, they were also interested in that, so they uh, helped with uh, integrating this into the, so in the, into the eBPF Go library. So that's done uh, on the kernel side, some, some uh, small changes that we, uh, fixes that we did, basically the redirect peer, it, it wasn't accounting traffic properly for Weave, but also for NetKit, um, this was detected from the ByteDance uh, folks uh, because they were using C-Advisor, uh, which collects uh, statistics from the NICs. So that's something we fixed. Um, and also the redirect peer, uh, we removed one indirect call from there, um, in particular around uh, NetKit, because for NetKit, the nice thing here is uh, it, it's configured as a bool instead of a tri-state for the kernel. Uh, so here we were using the indirect call macros. In the future, we, we might uh, follow up with the suggestion from Jacob to basically add a peer pointer into the device directly. Um, then we can also get this optimi optimization for Weave um, because then we don't have to rely on a uh, callback uh, or, or on, on a specific function uh, being present or not, which would have been the blocker for the case of Weave. Um, but yeah, so for NetKit at least, that problem has been solved um, and uh, for the Stilium integration, now going over to that, uh, for the next release in Stilium, which will be around summer this year, uh, Stilium 1.16, uh, we got the TCX site merged. 
so that work uh, is in. Uh, so basically, uh, for 6.6 .6 kernels or newer, uh, this will be enabled by default. And there will be an opt-out where you can still use legacy TC if you have to. Uh, but by default, it will use TCX. And the nice thing is now with Cilium, um, all of our attachments are now BPF link based. So this is like the, the milestone that has been achieved with that to make it more robust when other third party applications are also using those links. And here specifically, that's XDP, TCX, and the C group programs that we are using for the load balancing. Um, I hope you can, well, well, maybe it's more or less uh, viewable, but basically uh, uh, what we implemented is uh, and like, f the, uh, like for, the, for the up and, and downgrade path, um, if we have basically TCX enabled, uh, we will first check on the, on the BPF link, update the link if it's available. If it's not available, we actually try to attach the link. Once that succeeded, we remove the old style TC filter because in that case, given Cilium installs uh, TC programs which terminate the pipeline, then the old style uh, TC stuff is not executed anymore, so it can be safely removed. Um, in the case there was a failure or if the kernel didn't support it, uh, we continued to use the old style uh, attachments and uh, the last part here is the removal of the TCX link, so that's relevant when you do a downgrade or when you ha don't have the feature enabled, so that uh, when you attach the old style, it's not run yet, but once you remove the TC link, then it's executed again. So, yeah, um, the attachment, so basically what we decided in case of Cilium, um, we attach as the last entity on the TCX so that other observability programs, for example, from the Datadog agent, uh, they can attach before us. Uh, so they have this possibility there. Um, yeah, so that's our convention here. Uh, when we were trying to run the BPF programs as is, for the old style TC, uh, the connectivity test suite passed except for some minor tests uh, which failed and what uh, there was like one small difference in the uh, on, on the kernel side um, so we fixed that in the BPF program uh, which is basically zeroing out the TC class ID so what happens in the old style uh, BPF uh, is that this is being zero out, zeroed out in the CLS BPF uh, but the TCX doesn't have that specifically because you can move this into the into the BPF program. And um, after the execution of that, basically this uh, value gets propagated into the SKB TC index. Um, and yeah, Cilium is using pretty much most of the of such metadata fields to um, set specific bits uh, for the proxy and, and and whatnot. So this was uh, the one thing that we had to zero. Um, but other than that, um, everything is working and connectivity tests passing and we merged it. Can, can I ask a, a question? <laughs> what, what is the right once doing there? Say again? It, why, why do we have the right once? Is it really needed? Or is it just a uh, cut and paste type maybe? I'm actually not sure, yeah. We actually don't need I don't, doesn't look, I don't think yeah, need, yeah, I don't think it's needed, yeah. it's just, yeah. I was curious if there was some reason I wasn't seeing, but. No, I don't think it's actually needed. All right, cool. Um, so the next step, what is ongoing right now is the integration for NetKit. Um, Cilium already has a, an option for selecting data path mode. Uh, like for, for Weave, we did have IPv LAN, we retired it. And now this is being extended for NetKit. So I, like the, go the goal is to have like the default NetKit L3 mode uh, and then also NetKit L2 mode. I actually initially started with the L3 mode, then <laughs> run into some uh, road blockers uh, um, around the L3 side of things where Cilium agent internally has some logic around the, the MAC address handling uh, on the CNI side and internally where I run into some crashes that I'm still debugging. So I thought, okay, I will 
continue with the NetKit L2 because it comes closest to the to the Weave case uh, for the time being, and then once that is resolved, move over because I can see that th that this one is working. And um, in general, so I, I got this working. I also got the connectivity tests with Cilium to pass. Uh, run into two issues in there. One is that. Uh, I will still send patches for this for the NetKit driver. We, for the L2 mode, we didn't have uh, the uh, NDO or in general the option to set a specific MAC address. And it looks like in case of Cilium we do, because somebody added uh, some pod annotations as an option to specify a, sp a specific MAC. Um, so yeah, I didn't consider it on the initial uh, submission, so that will be added. Uh, basically, what happens is that this failed once we try to set the MAC addresses. But with the small patch, that uh, is resolved. Um, and that got me pretty far. So with just that, there were like three or four uh, tests failing, uh, all resolving around the L7 proxy that we have in Cilium. And it turned out uh, there was an issue on the SKB packet type uh, that the, uh, and how NetKit is, is handling that. And what basically happens is um, on packets going out of the network namespace, so initially you have the packet outgoing when, when, when you want to send them out of the node. Um, the scrubbing that we do in, in uh, NetKit before we uh, switch the net network namespace basically sets the packet type to packet host, which is all fine and good. Uh, then we run the BPF program and the BPF program uh, overrides the packet type in case of the L7 proxy to also set it to packet host. Um, but in case we pass it to the host stack, uh, we have this if type trans uh, callback here. Um, which does a couple of things. For example, it uh, pushes uh, the, the Ethernet header, uh, the SKB data pointer forward, uh, so that we start at L3 is one of the things. Then it sets SKB protocol and it also sets the SKB packet type. And in this case, it basically overrides the packet type um, in that specific one to packet other hosts. So this is later on dropped. Uh, when ingressing in the host stack. Um, why, is it, why was it not a problem in the, uh, in the TC case? Well, in the TC case, um, all of this stuff here is done in the weave once we traverse from the, um, like once it traverses the network namespace and all this comes later, right? So in the, in the TC case, we, we basically enter the BPF program with the packet other host, and then we override it to packet host. Uh, so yeah, so that's the issue uh, we run into. And um, I think there are a couple of options to, to get this fixed. Um, one is to yeah, like change the BPF program to just override the destination MAC addresses to the MAC address of the uh, host NetKit peer device uh, so that you retain packet host, that's one. Another one would be to move the EVE type trans before we actually run the BPF program. Um, could work. Uh, it's a bit ugly because then we have to do this SKB uh, pull push dance uh, because EVE type trans moves that pointer so we have to move it back and then only once we pass uh, up to the host stack, we, we have to move it again to the L3, to the start of the L3, right? So that's a bit ugly. Another option could be to detect whether uh, the BPF program actually set the, the packet type, and then if it did, we override it again after the EVE type trans. Uh, but I don't think there's a good opportunity where we can uh, save this metadata. So one thing um, I'm considering now is basically to um, uh, when no BPF program is attached in the NetKit driver, then we call Eve type trans because then there's no one else who can do it for us. But if there's a BPF program attached to it, then we just uh, rely on the BPF program to set packet type if needed, right? And the only thing we would do when we pass the packet up to the uh, host um, stack is to just do the SKB pull from the driver. 
uh, but otherwise, yeah, it, it, it would be up to the BPF program. Um, yeah, if you have any <laughs> other suggestions or comments, let me know. I'm missing, <coughs> so it's only the problem when you like, <coughs> The SQB dev that you pass, the MAC address is different. So, but you you probably still have like BBF running before you pass it to a different like container. Can you just set the packet type again there to like just packet host? Because uh, the, the only thing happening is because the MAC of SQB dev is not the one, right? That's the so, only reason, yeah. Yeah, so it just says as a host because it thinks it's well. So that's like a normal packet receive path. Uh, but you're not like after it's going so like further down what is not shown on the screen it's not yet consumed by the stack right by mm -hmm. the networking stack so you still have a chance to like run some bpf there and set packet type no i mean yeah so you would have to run bpf after you run bpf again and i don't if, if I understand you correctly, I'm not quite sure. But yes, but it's only when you're forwarding, no? So this is only relevant when you pass the packet into the host stack in the, in the host namespace. Otherwise, like when you send the packet out uh, with this netkit redirect, it doesn't really matter because it will just push it to the physical device and then send it out. So there's no particular check, right? The, the, the check on the packet type is only if you if you go up to the host network stack. <coughs> Maybe and another solution to set the SKB dev properly to the dev of the where to the actual dev that you are redirecting to, then the East type trans will match it correctly and will set it to the host. Um It, you still fail the Mac check, right? If you don't overwrite the desk Mac, isn't there a check below there? Or is say again? Wouldn't you? Isn't there a desk Mac to dev check on the Mac address? So that's inside, inside these type trends. Inside the trends, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's comparing the that Mac that it sees in SKB matches to the device, yeah. and that's how it knows whether it's this or other host. Yeah. Because I think, like on a BBF site, you don't override. Uh, actually, you do override it here to peer. Or since you you're not actually redirecting to that peer, but to something else, I'm confused. I, I thought the dev was correct. It was just the desk Mac that was wrong. The desk Mac is, is so like I, the dev is pointing to the right thing, yeah. but because the BPF program never changed the desk Mac. Oh, because the inside the VFU, you, you didn't. Yeah. Oh, okay. It looks like, a, what do they call those? A, did, you get some warning in demonization. I Martian, I did Martian Mac uh -huh. address or something. So you kind of made it promiscuous, uh, but well, add the flag yeah. to add the flag to these type drives that consider this device as promiscuous, that this Mac is also host. Yeah, in, in, in that sense, you can con consider it like that, right? Because uh, when the BPF program says netkit pass, it means like, okay, I, exp I explicitly don't want to drop it. I don't redirect it outside the node, but I want to pass it up the whole stack. So in mm -hmm. that sense, yeah. 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 My recommendation was just to not call ETH type trans. Just, yeah. Just, just push past the MAC header. Uh, and it has the, the checks for multicast and broadcasts. You probably want those. Can NetKit do multicast? <laughs> I mean, like, there's this is after the multicast duplication, right? But anyways, that's a different different thing. Yeah. I, I think that's actually an interesting point because I, I think that the test that's failing here is like we're doing transparent proxying, so the packet is destined like it comes from this pod container on this node, destined to somewhere on the internet or something like that. And we're deliberately trying to hijack that and send it into this proxy to do L7 functionality. Yep. Um, and that's where this kind of stuff comes up. So that, that's why it's like not really destined for the stack. We're kind of trying to work around that because we want to add additional functionality there. So when it comes to like manipulating the MAC addresses or whatever, like we kind of don't care. We're just, we need to get it into that application so we can apply a, like more advanced L7 functionality. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that, that doesn't mean that like directing traffic towards the stack shouldn't have the right behavior. 
So that's the flip side. Say again? Like obviously if the traffic is actually coming from Nitkit towards the local stack, like this should be lined up correctly, right? Like mm -hmm. Did you have a comment or what? Oh, okay, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll continue to find a solution on, on that that would be uh, feasible. The good thing is, at least for the regular L3 mode, we don't have the problem because, in the case of the L3, the MAC addresses should all be zeroed and it will just match. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so my next step after that, uh, after I get the test passing, uh, is to basically continue with the L3 mode. There's a bit more work needed here, uh, but yeah, should also be uh, straightforward. I don't see any particular blocker. Um, yeah, future work so that will that I want to tackle after. Uh, after the Cilium integration is, is basically to get the headroom and tailroom adjustment. So that's for the tunneling, tailroom for wire guards. So um, it should maybe get some tiny amount of uh, performance out of it. Um, there's currently no way to set this manually uh, for, like as a user. So I'm thinking to extend that. Um, so that we can set this from the Cilium agent uh, for both devices when we create uh, the NetKit devices in, on, in our CNI. So that's one thing. The other thing is doing, uh, like having a um, callback, uh, so that like a new N NGO in the, in the driver so that we can set the GSO uh, max sizes for, for big TCP uh, so that we can do this from the host device for both devices, so that both devices are updated, um, because Cilium cannot enter a target network namespace. So that's uh, uh, something where we don't have access to from the agent side. Uh, so if, if we uh, uh, do this adjustment from the primary NetKit device, and then it will do it for both. Um, so that would be a solution for that. And the same also for the for the MTU. So right now, uh, NetKit doesn't implement that uh, helper, but I'm thinking to, to do the same to adjust MTU from the primary uh, device so that it will affect both devices. Um, future work further out um, is to add AFXDP support, uh, but yeah, probably yeah second half of, of the year or so. Uh, once all the other issues are resolved. But that would be the plan, because uh, there's um, QMO, uh, which has native AFXDP support. And I talked with some uh, folks from the, uh, from the cloud native space that it would be great to have. Like, they tried with the Weave, and it's too slow. Uh, they want to um, get to 100 gigabit uh, throughput and beyond. And yeah, so I, I would like to explore that path as well, if we can make this work. Um, so uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. What do you mean? So QMO already have AFXDP support. Yeah, they can backend. yeah use it to like transmit receive uh, through the physical NIC. And you're saying you want to when QMO running inside containers through the NetKit? Yeah, yeah. But exactly. why? I'm not following. What's the use case here? Like you will start a VM inside the container? Yeah, exactly. Lightweight VMs. That's what people. That's what people want. Um, you you probably are in, somewhat involved in, in that as well. Intel Cloud Hypervisor. It's a Rust VMM, <laughs> minimal. <You> can, <laughs> it, it means container end users can run my BPF tools because they've got their own kernel. So it makes me happy. <laughs> and, and AWS has Firecracker, which is the exact. The yeah, and this model, Firecracker is which is based on, or at least original. And there's another one, Grass VM. Thanks to Chrome OS. 
Okay. Um, last topic, uh, the socket iterators. Um, what's our problem? Why do we need this? So basically in Selenium we have the, uh, like the east-west load balancing. We use the socket hooks on connect, bind, and, and whatnot. And in case of the TCP and UDP for connect, so we basically pick a backend for the given whip, and then we connect directly to the backend. But the problem uh, we run into is once this backend terminates, um, there's no way where this application, which is connected to that backend, gets feedback. Uh, for TCP, well, you will, if the backend terminates and um, yeah, like in, in the worst case, that IP gets reused for some other node or for some other part. Uh, you would probably get a TCP reset, um, <laughs> but in general, it's not nice. So basically, what we want is to terminate that connection. For UDP in particular, for connected UDP, uh, mainly related to DNS resolvers, uh, it's worse because there's no signal that we uh, that we get once the IP gets reused, right? So that's why. Um, in some of the past conferences, there was the socket destroy uh, kfunk proposed. It also got merged in the kernel. Uh, but one uh, issue that is still there is uh, that we need to, yeah, like given applications are running inside pods, inside network namespaces, that we need to have uh, access to that, uh, which we currently don't. Um, what has been solved today in Cilium is to is to solve this problem only in the host namespace through the socket destroy um, functionality from Netlink, for in particular for all the kernels, uh, where we use the Diac infrastructure. Additive worked on this, um, but for yeah more modern kernels. Uh, we have been stuck a little bit. Uh, one blocker was that we couldn't use kfunks yet. That has been resolved. So we updated LVM recently from 10 to now 17, uh, which is great. Um, so that is now usable. And the second part is uh, yeah, we would like to have some iterator where we can go over all the sockets. So there, are in, in, in general, there are potential options. I think like in the last year's conference, what was proposed to have uh, like a global flag for the existing iterators. Um, but if, if I recall correctly, it was maybe not flexible enough as, an, as from an API point of view. Um, some other uh, approaches uh, we've been thinking about, um, but then this continued, uh, is to basically on, on the socket connect call, uh, that we store like a K pointer for, of, of the socket in the in like in, in a hash map, um, and then once the backend terminates, we iterate through that and uh, destroy the socket. But the problem here is you would have to hold the reference on the socket. Uh, so yeah, like if the application closes that before, so you keep sockets around for no good reason. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is. Uh, yeah, maybe SockMap as a, just as a storage without actually any BPF programs. Um, but yeah, we, we didn't continue that path. Like I think uh, last year, I think we've seen still too many bugs. I mean, now it's stabilized. Uh, but then also we don't really need the, the PSOC functionality of that and everything it installs, right? Um, so one thought was to just have like a simple uh, iterator uh, around network namespaces and then potentially feed this into um, another iterator for sockets. Uh, so here's like, like just a stupid slow toy example. Um, so we would have a network namespace iterator and then we could feed this uh, pointer from the network namespace into uh, the iterator where we go over the sockets from that network namespace. Um, Super slow. Uh, in this case, it also is slow path uh, once the backend terminates. But yeah, so this was one approach. Um, the implementation of that open coded iterator actually fairly straightforward. The network namespaces, they already have a linked list. So basically, what I did here is to stash this into an array uh, on the creation side and keep the reference um, together with this uh, network namespace tracker. Um, and yeah, then on the next, we just 
feed back the, the, the pointer. Um, and given it holds the reference, we can use this in, in the non-sleepable, but also sleepable context. And on destructions, we drop the references again and then free the actual uh, array. So yeah, so that works. Um, one next step is basically here to uh, what I've been, yeah, I just did this like a few days before the conference. So uh, the, the, the next step is basically to get the verifier to accept uh, for the inner loop the network namespace object. Um, and uh, yeah, so one thing I ran into from the verifier side is that it uh, has to be trusted. Um, and yeah, so I, I played around with this like, well, holding reference obviously doesn't work because then it tries to loop forever and at some point stops. <laughs> uh, it, it, it cannot uh, basically prune this, this path. Um, so uh, I will look into this uh, reference object ID whether we can do something here so that, like given the, the references are held in the next and destroy like in, in, in the initial allocation and then in the in the destructor, uh, not from the BPF program itself. Uh, so I will look into um, uh, getting this this working. Um, yeah, by, by probably extending the verifier for that. Yeah, this I think this would be really useful because um, they're in general being able to have like a block of code where you're guaranteed that something is trusted based on what the k the k funk returned is I think yeah. not an uncommon pattern necessarily. Like yeah. for example, <clears throat> with SCEDX, we have some global variables that we return as as trusted k pointers so that mm -hmm. we can use k funks, but they're always going to be trusted no matter what, right? Like you don't need to use references. Um, yeah. And these are these are. Uh, these are CPU mask objects, so the uh, the release doesn't even actually release a reference. So if we had a notion of like, this is trusted, but if you want to put it in a map, you still have to get a ref count. That would be super useful for a lot of use cases, I think. Okay, yeah, sounds good. And I think also you had a use case, John, like for the for the device, uh, you wanted to iterate devices for a specific network namespace, so that could also. Uh, quick uh, question. So it looks like the old net and SSI in ADR. Why do you need another array? Can you just like walk the ADR in your uh, net and S iterator? Maybe. Uh, I haven't looked into connecting this with the IDR. I can take a look. Um, because because that three alloc array <coughs> kind of yeah <laughs> yeah that's fair. I will take a look. Um, if that somehow doesn't interfere with the ref with holding the reference and then dropping it, um, I'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then for that work, the the last step would be to basically convert like the um, current iterator into the open coded iterator model um, to be able to use it. But cool, yeah, that's all I have. <laughs>